Good afternoon. I am excited to uh, introduce Gretchen McCulloch. Gretchen is a linguist and popular blogger at All Things Linguistic, where she writes about linguistics for a general audience, especially internet language. Gretchen was early resident linguist at The Toast, where she wrote about topics like how we know that Bandicoot Cabber Patch is a perfectly syn reasonable synonym for Benedict Cumberbatch. <laughs> that was a mouthful. And grammar and the grammar of the Doge meme, if you're familiar with that. She is currently writing a, a pop linguistics book about internet language and the future of English for Riverhead Books. Gretchen has a master's in linguistics from McGill University and recently presented at South by Southwest on the li linguistics of billions of monkey in collaboration with Swift Key. Today she will present a talk titled The Linguistics Found in Billions of Emoji. Now, as this kind emoji is, is pointing out, please make sure that you silence your cell phones. <laughs> However, we'd like you to keep them out and tweet with the Donner Doom hashtag and any other social media vehicles that you like to use. Uh, without further ado, please help me welcome Gretchen McCulloch. Thank you. I realized after, long after we had already chosen this title that this talk could also have been called Emoji and the English Language, Dawn or Doom, uh, which would have been a little bit more thematically appropriate. So if you like, you can, you can amend that in your own mind. Um, so let's just make sure this is working. Um, so yes, um, this is me. Uh, I, I don't really need to do my introduction because I was already given one. Um, <laughs> but if you are live tweeting and you'd like to tag me in it, there's my Twitter handle. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, and I'd also like to thank SwiftKey because I worked with them to get uh, the data for this. Uh, they have a, this popular smartphone keyboard app that you may have heard of. And uh, we looked at this large scale anonymous aggregate set of the data that they had about what's uh, what people are actually doing with emoji, uh, how are people actually using it, and we found some really interesting stuff. Um, so they've published several emoji things uh, with various data sets. They have the United States of emoji. Um, I looked up uh, for, uh, for this talk which ones were the most popular in Indiana. So there's the video game controller, uh, which you can see on the map, and also the tomato emoji, um, and the knife and fork emoji. Um, are disproportionately popular in Indiana. So if anyone would like to tell me afterwards why that's the case, I'm very interested in your theories. <laughs> and I'm expecting the food here to be really good, um, especially the tomatoes. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's why, we, why we came to do this. And well, let's start by talking a little bit about where emoji come from and how they fit into the internet linguistic landscape. So emoji start out in 1999. Anybody remember these devices? <laughs> Few people, <laughs> not enough people. <laughs> I feel really old now. Um, mobile phone users in Japan were sending a lot of picture messages to each other. But these were too big, especially on the networks of 1999. And so the solution that the network carriers found is instead of encoding the images pixel by pixel, you know when you see the image load pixel by pixel, if you just encode them as if they're text, when you send the letter A to someone, it just sends one number that turns itself into the letter A. It doesn't represent each of the individual lines like a picture of the letter A. So if you encode common images like a heart as if they're text, you can just send one number and then the other person's phone knows to interpret that as a heart. This is what Unicode does with emoji. Um, so the first, the first company to do this was Docomo iMode, a Japanese mobile phone provider, and others soon followed. But the problem was that first stage of companies were each encoding their own set of standards when it came to emoji. So if you had phones um, from, one, if, you, if you were on one network and your friend was on another network and you sent them a sequence of letters, you might have been intending a heart and they actually got a sad face or, or just a box. So this didn't go so well. So this is when the Unicode Consortium stepped in and they were originally formed to work on alphabets um, to standardize what each of these symbols 
uh, stood for. And they've recently come into the news because every time we want to add a new emoji, we have to go ask the Unicode Consortium, hey, can we have a taco? Hey, can we have a dumpling? <laughs> can we have an upside down smiley face? You know, maybe women could do stuff. Um, <laughs> We have to keep asking the Unicode Consortium for this uh, because they're in charge of the standardization. But that's also what enables us to all see the same things. Um, and emoji use became popular in the West after emoji keyboards were introduced. So on iOS, that was in 2011, on Android in 2013. And the Unicode Consortium is still kind of working out the kinks in terms of what's popular, what's needed, um, on this phone, as we saw, you know, the, the taco emoji was not there. What an oversight. Um, adding skin tone modifiers, because not everyone is yellow. Um, in fact, no, no one is yellow. Um, <laughs> we're, not, we're not Simpsons characters. Um, and the, the gender modifiers, you know, figuring out what people actually want to be talking about and changing this ad hoc system that just developed from, you know, a combination of what was in the Webdings font and what a couple Japanese mobile phone providers wanted to put on their phones into some sort of system that's, that's usable for a lot of people. But emoji aren't the first way of expressing emotion in text. And in fact, you know, the, emo the emoticon is a, is a precursor that in many cases accomplishes a similar thing. Um, punctuation, repeated letters, um, other types of slang like lol, omg, this, this incredibly dated great, um, are other ways of adding color and tone of voice to our texts and instant messages and emails and so on. And we'll see that the, there's a continuation here um, of, of a similar trend. But so there, there's data, this is SwiftKey's data showing that at a certain point, a year, about a year and a half ago, the face with tears of joy emoji and the smiling, um, smiling emoticon crossed paths. So at a certain point, people stopped using or reduced, began to reduce their usage of the older school emoticon and kept, started using emoji more. So they seem to kind of, they seem to overlap. People are using them for similar, similar purposes in a lot of cases. Um, and there's a study by Instagram that shows that people use particular emoji in the same types of contexts where they use other types of internet slang. So the tears of joy emoji is used in similar contexts as LOL, haha, -ha, LMAO, the heart emoji are used like XOXO, love you, moi, um, the loudly crying emoji, which looks like this, uh, is used like oh, and OMG and OMFG. Um, and so, and I find it helps for a lot of people, particularly people who are kind of, you know, not quite young people, but still kind of understand the internet, which is where I put myself, um, to translate emoji into other internet slang. Um, the first time I saw that the tears of joy emoji was actually the same as LOL, I was like, oh, I understand how to use that now. Um, so I find this, this helps. Uh, you know, it, you, you see a lot of themes recurring around emoji. Um, by themselves, emoji don't necessarily mean a whole lot, but when you look at emoji uses on a massive scale, you can also tell us a fair bit about our society and ourselves and what we, what we like to talk about. So one thing that's really interesting is that positive emojis vastly outnumber neutral and negative emojis. And part of this might be because there are more smiling type faces, but also people just say them more. Um, the other thing is that emoji are cute. So they tend to reinforce a happy message, but they can undermine a sad one. Um, so if, you, if you're really upset, you might not want to send someone a bunch of loudly crying emoji. That might be my kind of fake upset or exaggeratedly upset because the cuteness can undermine your message sometimes. And this year, Oxford Dictionaries named the face with tears of joy emoji as their word of the year. Um, <laughs> it is debatably a word. We're going to get back to that. <laughs> but it 
it was the most popular emoji by a large margin. It was newly, po uh, newly popular, kind of bursting onto the scene. It made up, this single emoji, 17% of emoji use in the US. Um, and this is a huge rise over 2014, where it made up only 9% of emoji in the US. So I, I don't think it's a word, but it's definitely of the year. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, 17, um, in 2005, in 2015. So, and if you look at the top 10 emoji, um, what I find is really interesting, so there's a lot of positivity, the sad emoji is dramatic, um, and these are all emotional. Their faces, um, you know, their hearts, their lips, they're all kind of emotive expressions. You don't see a lot of like animals or food objects, items, despite this, you know, the, the news interest of the taco emoji and things like that. And if you group them, um, the top categories of emoji, the happy faces, the sad faces, the hearts, um, hand gestures, the romantic stuff, a lot of this is face, faces, hands, emotions. Um, these slides will be online right after the talk if you want to have high quality copies since I see a few people taking photos. Um, <laughs> you can do that too, but they will be online. Um, so we see a lot of face and hand embodiment in this. And sometimes an emoji will spike just because of a particular person. Uh, so this is DJ Khaled, and he is fond of the key emoji, which he uses to dispense major key life advice. Um, and you know, not to do with unlocking something, but keys to success. And so his followers uh, also use this emoji to indicate life advice. Uh, fans of Kanye West often use the goat emoji um, and it's not because he's do a domesticated ruminant animal, um, but it's because it's an acronym for greatest of all time, uh, AKA GOAT. Uh, and you can see in this graph, there's the key emoji, and that's when DJ Khaled started using it. We don't know if he uses Swift key, but that's when he started using it. Um, and you can also do this by state. So Hawaii, um, you know, has the, the palm trees and the drinks and the surfing, um, which might not totally surprise you. Um, so sometimes emoji use by region reinforces assumptions and stereotypes um, about a particular area. Uh, and other times it's completely unexplainable. So Hawaii is pretty obvious. Um, Nevada. <laughs> Where Las Vegas is. <laughs> you know, at least they're eating their vegetables. Maybe there's some DJ Khaled fans here, and you know. Um, Louisiana is the birthplace of, uh, home of New Orleans, the birthplace of jazz, so it uses a lot of guitar emoji. Um, French speakers use a lot of hearts, both kinds of hearts. So you, you go to Paris, you're in love, you get your heart broken, you find a new love um, with sparkles on it. Um, the Nordic countries tend to <laughs> use a lot of Santa emoji, uh, except for Finland. So Denmark, Norway, and Sweden um, use, a, you know, use a lot of Santa, but Finland doesn't, even though they claim that's where Santa lives. So I think you know, they've got to step up their game. <laughs> the, so Australia and Portugal might surprise you, but they actually have um, some of the most permissive drug laws in the world. Portugal was the first country in Europe to decriminalize drugs, so you know maybe this isn't this is entirely legal, or maybe they're talking about you know prescription drugs. Maybe they're always sick. I don't know. Um, and sometimes you get things that are a little bit more surprising. So Montana, North Dakota, and Wyoming are all in the top five for the use of LGBT emoji. Uh, like the men holding hands, women holding hands, a rainbow, and stuff like that. Um, you know, it's, it's not as clear why, why those states in particular. Um, and sometimes you think, well, maybe an emoji is used in a particular area precisely because it's less common in that area. There's more of a novelty factor. So Idaho ranks number one for the iPhone or mobile phone emoji. Um, unlike California, despite Silicon Valley being there. So maybe people in Silicon Valley are already bored at talk, of talking about smartphones and they've like moved on to something else. Um, so another example of this is many sunny states don't actually rank very highly for the sun emoji, 
which might be because it's just kind of boring because it's sunny there all the time. And in the States, when it's mostly rainy and the sun comes out, everyone's using the sun emoji constantly. Um, another example of this is uh, in a lot of Arabic speaking regions, they use a lot more plant, flower and plant emoji, despite being kind of desert areas. Maybe this is more interesting than if you have a whole bunch of flowers around you. Who knows? Um, but so moving from this kind of ornamental use, we can look at you know, probability distributions of emoji and see what things are associated with particular areas. But what I want to know is, can we consider emoji a language? You know, let's, the, the, let, let's look at the linguistic secrets part. Um, if you're interested in moral panics, if you're interested on the doom side, you could follow that with, are emoji a universal language? Are they going to replace English? Are we going to go to hell in a handbasket? <laughs> but let's, let's start out with the basic question. So the first thing we want to talk about is what even is a language? So people often see emoji and think of hieroglyphs, but there's actually an important difference between them. So in the history of our own alphabet, We've seen symbols move from the very concrete. So here's an ox's head in hieroglyphs, which stands for literally the idea of an oxen, to the more abstract shape, standing for, the, so the word for oxen in proto Sinaic was aleph, something like aleph. Um, and then it starts standing for the sound at the beginning of the word for ox. Um, and then it gets transmitted to cultures like the Greeks who didn't even know that was the word for ox in someone else's language, and they just used it for the sound alpha, which had nothing to do with oxen. And so the thing is, it's way more useful to be able to talk, to be able to write, to talk about any word with an ah sound, than it is to be able to talk about oxen. You know, how many times do you talk about oxen in your daily life? How many times do you say a word with the ah sound? When you scale it up, if you take 26 of the thing on the right, you have a zoo. If you have 26 of the thing on the left, my left, sorry guys, um, <laughs> you have, you can talk about anything in the universe with 26 letters. So this increased abstraction is what really makes language very useful. So what we want to know when we turn to emoji is, are there emoji that have abstract meanings? Do some of them have meanings that would not be obvious from just the sum of their parts, from just looking at them, oh, I know what that means immediately. So, <laughs> are there emoji that mean things beyond their literal symbol? <laughs> well, this eggplant here, which may have been why it's used in Vegas, um, is a phallic symbol. The peach is also raunchy. The paint's fingernails is not innuendo, but it's used as kind of a dismissive gesture, which you don't automatically get from uh, painting fingernails. There's a few emoji that are used for things that you wouldn't necessarily have to get from their pictures. Uh, funny story, I was on a radio, I was talking about emoji, my dad's really proud of me, he listens to the radio, he says, yeah, you sounded great, I just have one question. What does the eggplant emoji stand for? <laughs> uh. But having a non-literal meaning isn't enough to say that emoji are language. So there are other nonverbal symbols that carry meaning, but they're not particularly linguistic, um, and many of them are quite old. So the heart symbol doesn't look like your physical heart, not really. And even the association between the idea of love and the physical heart is arbitrary. You know, it's, it could, be, could have been your spleen. Um, and same thing goes for a lot of symbols. The idea of stopping isn't inherently red and octagonal. That's an arbitrary symbol. Um, so for emoji to really be linguistic, they also have to mean different things in different com combinations. They need grammar. So there has to be a difference between the emoji equivalent of man bites dog and dog bites man, something like that. So let's see what we can find with emoji combinations. So, and we looked at what people are actually doing, doing with this. So first of all, categories again. We see the same thing that we've been seeing um, before, faces, hands, emotions are really high, uh, also raunchy stuff. Um, and, but let's look at a few of what's in these categories. Let's break down this big one with happiness and laughter. So it turns out <laughs> people are really original here. Uh, you know, tears of, the, the, the top one is tears of joy, tears of joy. 
Tears of joy, tears of joy, tears of joy. Tears of joy, tears of joy, tears of joy, tears of joy. And I'm sure if we'd actually looked at sequences of five emoji in a row, I think I know what we would have found. Um, and I, this makes sense to me because the tears of joy stands for laughter, and it's pretty rare that you laugh with just one ha. So I think people are repeating it because it's a repetitious sound of laughter. You often write ha 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 or lol lol lol. Um, when it comes to emoji combinations, 30% of unique combinations include this tears of joy emoji. It's very popular at indicating you're laughing at something in particular. Um, and within that, there's a slight preference to put that emoji indicating the stance, the laughter part, before the second emoji or the third and fourth emoji indicating what you're laughing at. It's slight, but it's significant. We've got a lot of data points. And this is a nice validation of earlier studies of emoji, um, which there have been done. Um, so Tyler Snublin has found that, with a completely different data set from Twitter, that emotions tend to be before objects in the same order. So, so maybe, maybe there's some glimmerings of a glamour. We want to look, we want to keep going. So we're looking for messages that are greater than the sum of their parts. Here's a couple. Um, <laughs> I hope, I hope this talk wasn't supposed to be kept PG-13. Um, <laughs> so there's some sex and emoji combinations here. And I think this is, gets to something really interesting. There aren't any emoji that directly symbolize sex or sex acts. Um, and so people get inventive. Um, and surprisingly, because we did check, there are no eggplant emoji in the top 200 emoji combinations. So I guess by the time things reach the eggplant stage, you're just sending, you're not combining them anymore. <laughs> or something. Um, so, but this also begins to point us to one of the differences between words and emoji. So external organizations like the Unicode Consortium control which emoji exists. And it makes sense that they want to keep things G-rated. I'm not saying they're wrong for keeping things G-rated. I don't want to have to worry that my keyboard's going to fall into the hands of a child and they're going to get, you know, asking me uncomfortable questions. But at the same time, sex is an important part of many people's lives. It's why we're all here today. It's how we're all here today. <laughs> um, and it's, it seems a bit weird that you can't use it. Whereas with a dictionary, um, you, know, you don't have to wait for Oxford or Merriam-Webster's permission before you start using a word. In fact, they're catching up with you. They're constantly adding new words that people have started using um, because you can use the same 26 letters to make uh, any, any new word you want or to write any new word you want. Um, and, it, and if they decide, no, I don't like your new word, you can keep using it. That's not the case for emoji because we're more dependent on the technological standards that implement them. Um, a few other combinations. So does anyone know the, the far one? Queen B, Beyonce. Um, does anyone know the middle one? So I, I heard someone say it, snorting cocaine. So this is technically a rice bowl. <laughs> um, but uh, and anyone know the, this last one? So this one's fairly obscure. It was popular for a brief flash in the memory of the internet. Um, but it refers to the Pope bars meme. So there was a meme about the Pope rapping based on this weird photo. And so people were using this to represent the Pope rapping. Um, so there's a few other creative combinations that people do. Um, but a lot of these, you kind of have to be told what they mean. They're not necessarily immediately transparent. Um, and the other question that I have is, how often do people actually do this? Is this a common thing? Um, or where are people doing this? So we have data. So just because we can create emoji stories, how often do we actually do them? So only 4.6% of uh, messages in SwiftKey use any emoji at all. That's 95% that don't use emoji at all. So if you're wondering if emoji are taking over and we're only using emoji, I can say no. Um, <laughs> because there's a lot of stuff that people are doing. Maybe this is all people's emails to their boss. Um, let's look at what people do within this sliver. So 15% of this sliver is just emoji used alone. So if we want to know, do people tell stories in emoji? Are emoji something that could be used to replace English? 
Um, are people you know, not using words anymore because they're using emoji? You have to find it in this 15% of 4.6%. Um, but that's the thing. That's the kind of stuff that makes stories, that makes headlines. These translations of you know, Moby Dick into <laughs> emoji, things like that. That's what makes headlines, yet that doesn't look like what people are actually doing. But let's drill down even further. So if we dig into this sliver, we can see the majority of emoji-only utterances are just one or two emoji. So this is probably a lot of these face with tears of joy. You know, people reacting or responding to something um, with a sequence of a couple emoji. There are just so few of these extended, longer sequences of emoji that we could think of as emoji stories. Um, there's, there's a tiny number of them, but you know, we have data. Let's keep going. Um, what do these emoji stories look like? So as you can see, they look a lot like stories. <laughs> um, so these are the top 10 sequences of three and four emoji. And they're, there's a lot of repetition. They're, they're all repetition. And in fact, you have to get to number 23 on each of these lists before you start seeing anything that's not just straight up repetition. Um, and the, the other cool thing we can do with this is that linguists have already calculated this same data for sequences of words based on large corpora of billions of words. So we can see what that looks like as well. So these are the most common sequences of three and four words based on the Corpus of Contemporary American English by Mark Davies. Um, so this is from a data set of about half a million words. You can tell it's American English because the United States is in there. Um, and you notice that there's not really a lot of repetition at all. Like the only repetition you get is stuff like the rest of the and as well as, which don't have the same kind of feeling to them uh, as the emoji. And the other thing you get from this is this gives you something. This, this feels interesting. This has some, some emotion to it. This is kind of the boring part. You know, these are all those fiddly little words that go in between the interesting stuff, um, the, the, the grammar. So, um, and we can keep going. So if we zoom out a bit and we go for the top 200 pairs, um, pairs and triplets and quartets of words, uh, and I'm not going to show them all because, you know, I, I'm, I'm making our, our lovely uh, visualizer draw billions of emoji. I'm not going to make her also draw billions of words. Um, so 0% of the top sequences of words are repetition. Over half of the top sequences of, of emoji are repetition. And it's not that you can't repeat words ever. So sometimes you can say it's very, very, very good, or I love, 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 love it. And you could use heterogeneous sequences of emoji with different uh, different emoji in combination with each other. It's just that for some reason we don't. And so, but let's keep going. Let's look at what these sequences of different, I'm going to put this in quotation marks, emoji look like. So we counted three hearts in three different colors as a sequence of, sequence of three different emoji. You know, we counted the three monkeys doing the three things as sequences of different emoji. Like, this is not what you think of when you think of, oh, this is what a sentence looks like. And we got a lot of sequences where you'd get, you know, one thing like thumbs up, then a hundred, then a thumbs up. So you'd get kind of an A, B, A sequence of emoji. You don't get this a lot with a lot of words. Like you can say, you know, big bad wolf, but you don't very often say big bad big wolf. That sounds kind of weird. So this sequence is, so it looks like emoji are governed more by aesthetics than by, than by system of grammar. Um, and I think this gets to, and there's, so there's just no evidence that emoji are commonly used to tell stories, narrate com complex sequences of events, um, or do the type of stuff that makes people worry when they think, man, you know, emoji, they could be this universal language, like we could just communicate anything in them. That, that's not what people are doing. And you know, sometimes people are you know, telling stories in emoji for fun, the way you might play charades for fun, but they're not doing it as a practical alternative communication because 
or they're just better at this. And this gets to where I think emoji fit in to our system of language. So traditionally, when it comes to speaking, we've had both formal and informal speaking. So when you're having a conversation, that's informal. When you're giving a speech, I'm giving a speech. That's a formal type of speech. I've practiced this. Um, I'm talking slower than I normally do. Um, whereas with written language, we just have uh, the formal genre is what we're used to. Books and magazines that go through an editor and you spend a, bun spend a bunch of time revising and banging your head against a keyboard and saying, why am I even writing this? Um, <laughs> whereas informal written language has been really rare. Um, you know, maybe if you send a couple postcards to people, you leave someone a note on the kitchen table, but we haven't had a big uh, amount of informal written language and especially we haven't been exposed to a lot of it beyond you know, very close friends and acquaintances. So when we start texting and tweeting and posting on various social media platforms, this creates an explosion in informal written language. And I think this is why people worry. Because imagine if the only exposure to English that you'd ever had was in TED Talks. You know, that's, that's English. But it's not representative of all of the English that you know and you're familiar with in your life. That's a very particular kind of English. But what we've had in writing has been kind of the written equivalent of just TED Talks or TED Talks and a couple, you know, people, actors telling, telling stories. It's not the full exposure to, you know, what could be done, what the full potential of the genre. So informal written language is the thing that uh, emoji become really useful for because in informal communication we pay a lot of attention to each other's tone of voice, our body language, our facial expression, our gestures. You know, if someone comes into the room and says, I'm not mad, you don't believe them. <laughs> You're paying attention to what they're doing with their body, not what the, the words they're saying. And so we have emoji there to provide this extra layer of embodiment on top of what we're actually saying, the literal words. And so, so I like to talk about emoji not as a language, but as a supplement to language. They repeat because our informal and emotive gestures like clapping and laughing often repeat, um, that they just make it efficient for ordinary people to write emotions in real time. It used to be, if you wanted to write emotions, you were a novelist. You were delving deep into the human psyche and representing emotions. But novelists get time and editors and all of this stuff in order to do a really good job at that. And if you're just sending someone a text, you know, unless it's one of those really important texts, you don't have three of your friends sitting around saying, oh, what should I say? Should I put a comma here? Sometimes you do. Um, <laughs> certain kinds of texts. Um, most of the time, you're just kind of sending it off very quickly. And so emoji are a faster way of doing that. Um, and it's really interesting to contrast this with early internet predictions, which suggested we were going to be making avatars. Remember Second Life? To embody ourselves? When it turns out what, we, what we're doing instead is, yeah, we have our profile pictures, and then we're using these kind of disembodied pieces of faces and hands of emotions to embody our emotions in a different sort of way. Um, and so I think it's easy to say, OK, well, what next? You know, are we going to be doing everything with stickers or reaction GIFs or custom like Bitmoji? Um, I think it's the, the way that it may be easy, easy to make sense of those is to fit them into this ways of representing and embodying em emotions. Just like those plain text, ASCII, emoticons, and abbreviations that we saw at the beginning. So, you know, emoticons didn't replace language. Um, ASCII flowers didn't replace language. Um, none of this stuff has happened. And in fact, when we come down to it, art and language, visual art and literature, have coexisted for a long, long time. They don't have to be mutually exclusive. What's hard about emoji <laughs> Um, is also what appeals to people about emoji, which is that there are so darn many of them. And because 
it's a lot harder to make an emoji more than the sum of its parts, the way you can make the letters of the alphabet or the words in the sentence greater than the sum of their parts. Every time we want to add another food item, we've got to add another emoji. Um, and so the, one of the problems is, uh, you know, we have to give a technological organization composed of a couple dude, tech dudes at a couple tables you know, this power over what we're all saying. And the other thing is, is this is a huge contrast with what language is doing. Language is an, the original open source project. It's a grassroots effort that we all contribute to, that we all draw on. And so it has a lot more potential even than emoji. Um, because it's, all you have to do is convince a couple people, other people to use it. You don't have to go ask an authority, you can just say stuff. Um, and so this is, this is a tension between language and emoji. The other tension at a lot of, at a more practical level is that it's hard to find the emoji you're looking for on your tiny screen. You're like, ah, oh, is there an animal that does the thing? I don't remember if there's a sheep. Um, I know there's a goat. Um, it gets harder to find the emoji you're looking for. And because emoji organization on your keyboard imposes a theory of categories of the universe. And it turns out that linguists and philosophers from the 1600s have been trying to create a universally sensible cat system of categorizing the universe, and they failed. Um, <laughs> In fact, Leibniz, who you might remember as the guy other than Newton who founded calculus, um, <laughs> Leibniz concluded that this was just going to be impossible. So this was a while ago um, that linguists and philosophers kind of gave up on this endeavor. And that's why when you're trying to find, you know, like a fruit emoji, you're not sure if it's under plants or if it's under food because these categories are are difficult and the universe doesn't divide itself neatly into distinct categories where we can name them all and picture them all and have them all unambiguously interpretable. Um, and I think this partly explains why we see such a high number of people using the same few emoji at the top. It's faster to just keep reusing your top emoji because you don't have to go find the other stuff in that big list. Um, so we're, we're, yeah, chaos, information overload. Um, and this brings us to the question that we started with, which is, are emoji, are they going to become this universal language? If everybody understands what the face with tears of joy emoji means, even if they don't all understand what the eggplant means. The thing is, is that I went through one set of of questions, which is, are emoji developing more abstract meanings? Could they develop a grammar? But the problem is every step we make along that trajectory makes them less universal. Every new emoji that acquires an abstract meaning, if somebody has to tell you that this stands for Queen B, or someone has to tell you that the painting fingernails is dismissive, that makes them no longer useful as a universal symbol. And that's because there's a fundamental tension with being abstract and being universal. You can't have abstraction unless it means something beyond the easily visualizable. That's what it means to, not, to be abstract. But universal stuff is universal because you can visualize it. So there's a catch-22. They can't be both universal and language at the same time because you know, it would have been great if we could find a universally easily understandable language. I know language classes are a pain. But it's not that easy. Um, emoji are universal the way pointing and grunting is universal. It's really useful sometimes. Like, you don't have a language in common with someone, you just point at something and say. But it's not going to replace, if you're going to live there for a while, you want to learn that language or you want to develop some sort of common language because you ultimately you do want to be able to communicate about things beyond the here and now which is part of what it means to have a human system of language beyond just what your dog can understand in the here and now. Um, what's cool about emoji is that they give us a renewed appreciation for the importance of this additional layer of tone of voice, of facial expressions, of gestures that we take for granted on top of the literal words we say because we haven't had a really good system for representing it. And so 
you know, once we get cute icons for them, we start paying attention to them more. And I think that's a sufficiently optimistic note to end on. Um, so thank you. Slides are on the hashtag. Thank you, Gretchen. If you have any questions that you'd like to ask of Gretchen, please uh, come up here to the microphone so we can get those on our recording. Thank you. Whatever well, was, you like. That was fantastic. Um, thank you. Um, I really like the idea that these are speech attributes or aspects, whatever you want to call them. Um, and I wonder if it isn't a sign of a kind of globalization of grammar in a sense, even though they stay inside these. Because a lot of what you were saying about the uses of pictorial language is already true in Japanese. I, I lived in Asia for a number of years. And the idea of doubling things to represent enforcement is in Indonesian. It's in English, too, where you say very, very, or even do a negative by saying yeah twice. You know, um, but visual and oral puns around images is a, is a common attribute in a lot of pictorial based languages to begin with, like Japanese or Thai. Even Mayan used like weird visual puns. So the usage got popular in Asia, but the habit of it may kind of indicate a certain appropriation of that into English. I mean, I think it's, there's definitely a lot of uh, Japanese influences that you can see in emoji. You know, the fact that they all fit in a square box because Japanese symbols all fit in a square box um, is something that, you know, people kind of take for granted. You know, Western symbols tend to have different, different sizes um, and shapes. Um, I think that it's very easy to overstate that uh, languages like Chinese and Japanese seem pictorial because there's a lot of abstraction in those languages as well, and that's why they're able no, to I communicate there, all this stuff. Like, yeah. There, there's weird levels of punning around how things look. Like when you study Japanese, characters do represent multi level things based on their association with other characters. Yeah. Um, I mean, I. I I, I do think we also have puns in English. Um, There's an interesting study that looked at kind of um, iconicity in spoken language, it just came out recently, uh, where they found that the word for nose in many languages is disproportionately likely, something like two thirds of the languages they surveyed. So not, you know, not all of them, but definitely a, a substantial majority is likely to have the sound N in it, the N sound, because you make the sound N with your nose. If you make it and touch your nose, you can feel it vibrating through your nose. So the idea being that people noticed this connection um, and took advantage of it when it came to when it came to that. Um, I'm, yeah, I think. Okay, well, that's the sign to move on to the next question. <laughs> iOS 10 just updated a bunch of the ways that the emoji look. They're bigger. I'm wondering if you've seen in past emoji updates or even in this one that people are interacting with them differently, maybe because they don't like or prefer the way that the new emojis display. Like I, I pick a, the one that has like the flat lined eyes and the flat mouth is like my go to because I mm -hmm. usually like whenever I'm wanting to send an emoji. But if it changed the way it looked, even if it meant the same thing, I don't think I'd send it. So I'm curious if you've seen that with. Yeah, um, I, I don't know if I can speak to how people change it with the future, but I can do it the other direction, how people change it to the past. So there was a study that looked at emoji that differ across iOS and Android um, and various different Android devices. Um, and they found the one that's the kind of flat mouth but with the, it's got canonically happy eyes, um, that it looks less happy on iOS than it does on Android. So people on iOS were uh, rating it and sending it to mean this kind of flat emotion, whereas people on Android, where it has a smileier mouth, were sending it to convey uh, happier emotions. Um, and so I think what we're seeing actually with some of the newer updates is that the designers are trying to converge a little bit um, and say, oh, well, we've realized that people have started doing this everywhere, and maybe we'd like to do this. So I noticed, like, 
the new Google uh, Android emoji. Um, they released their new, new tiers of joy emoji. I think it actually has blue tiers, unlike the old one, which didn't have blue tiers, because people started associating that with it. So I think, hopefully, I'd like to see a bit of a convergent convergence between the designers, because it's worrisome to me that what I send might not be what you receive. Um, and I think, you know, we can have a little bit of variation in terms of style, but hopefully they're conveying a similar emotional valence. Well, right now, they've, up they've taken away the gun emoji and made it a water gun, but yeah. only if you've updated iOS 10. So you could be playfully sending a water gun, and if a recipient hasn't updated, <laughs> you're saying something quite different. Yeah, and I mean, as we saw with the sex emoji, just because you don't have something in emoji doesn't mean people can't convey it somehow. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's unclear. It's unclear. Like, I feel like there is some effect, and I think you know, there's some, there's some research that's shown that there's some effect, but at the same time, people are very creative. Um, and if you know, you know, sometimes you know that your friend has a particular device and say, okay, I can't send that emoji because it looks weird on their device or something like that. You can, yeah, it's, a, it's definitely an interesting issue that we're, that we're constantly facing. Yeah. Um, thank you for your presentation. It was very interesting because I'm from Japan and I've been using emoji for over 10 years. <laughs> So um, when I came to the U.S., I often feel like non-Japanese people use different facial emoji than what I or Japanese people would use. So have you witnessed any misunderstanding caused by emoji by people from different backgrounds? I think the, background? the biggest one for Japan versus non-Japan, and it's kind of like it's not quite doesn't quite split like that. It splits up people who understand manga and people who don't understand manga. Um, because in Japanese, in general, like in Japanese illustration traditions, the emotions are indicated with the eyes. So in manga, you get the, the eyes, um, you get kamoji, um, which are the kind of flat emojis. People know the shrug emoji. Um, it's kind of the one that Westerners are familiar with, or sometimes the table flip emoji, but there's a whole bunch of them. Um, they really focus on the eyes for the expression of the emotion, and the mouth is not that important. Whereas Westerners really focus on the mouth, and the eyes aren't that important. So we see we've got this problem with the kind of flat mouth with happy eyes emoji, whereas where Westerners see the flat mouth, and they say, oh, it's, it's neutral or it's upset. Uh, where Japanese people see the, the happy eyes and say, oh, yeah, it's happy, clearly, because the eyes are doing that. Whereas if you don't know that's a convention because you've never read a manga, then that's not going to work. Um, there's also like the sweat tier one, which I think is used differently um, between Japanese speakers and Westerners. You probably noticed some of this yourself. I mean, feel, <laughs> uh, feel free to, for, to tell me this. But uh, yeah, there are definitely differences there. And so I think we also kind of overstate it when it comes to uh, a, a universally understandable thing, because even within just stylized representations of what someone's face looks like, uh, there can be differences there. Recently, um, with looking at how to use emojis for passwords or some sort of pictorial password as um, sort of a way to surpass dictionary-based password attacks hmm. and to help with uh, memory. So have you seen anything with how emoji use affects memory of conversations and in a linguistic setting how we're remembering things? That's a really interesting question. I'd really love for someone to, you know, do a proper study about that. Um, so, you know, feel free, free study ideas. Someone, someone do this and then report back to us when you do this. Um, I think that what I find interesting is that people develop certain associations around a particular set of emoji, either, you know, with a particular set of friends. I've heard from a lot of couples that have, like, their one couple emoji. Um, that they use just within their couple and it like has no meaning and hardly anyone else uses it like it's like the turtle emoji or the unicorn emoji or something and they just use that personally for their particular couple um, that they has an association for them because of some sort of in joke or something like that so I think they can kind of take on associations for particular groups of people um, yeah I think I imagine that you know m remembering what someone kind of interpreting intent from what someone means, whether they're joking or whether they're uh, you know, sincere or something like that is probably uh, where you're seeing a lot of these. But yeah, I'd, I'd really love to see a, see a study about that. Uh, hi, do you think we need some regulations or principles for inventing new emojis? Because I find that things are getting a little bit more complicated now. So many companies, big companies, and many groups are improving their ideas and the values on inventing new emojis. 
for example, the LGBT group and uh, the my, uh, color race people, so mm -hmm. they do not feel great about the golden smile. They also want black smile. And uh, also, uh, for example, so I think I, I know that a few months ago, uh, there was a new set of, you know, just going to be introduced to for the real Olympic, including like cycling, running, and swimming. And uh, shooting is one, I, I don't know the exact term, but like shooting is one of the Olympic game, uh, Olympic sports. Mm -hmm. but Apple is not a happy about introducing guns in the emoji because a Apple is anti-gun. But for, for example, for me, I don't re really care about the color of the emoji. Gold is great, I don't care what about um, <laughs> yellow or brown or black. I don't care, gold is, uh, gold is great. And also for gun, if I only just want to send a gun, I don't really want to express my like political, political view. But because for, um, perhaps in the future, just because Apple is anti-gun. I cannot use the gun emoji. That, that doesn't make me happy. So I want to know what's your opinion on this kind of thing. Yeah, I think it's. I think it's just. It's a big question, and it's. It's created. It's. It's kind of an artifact of the fact that you need to have a standards organization so that our phones can know which symbol we're seeing which I do think is important because I don't want to get those little boxes that you can't show you anything. But at the same time, those rules are created by humans who have their own agendas and have their own opinions. And you know, the, you know, if you want to be a member of the Unicode Consortium, it costs like a couple thousand dollars a year. And most of us don't have that kind of money to just like, oh yeah, I'm going to go join the Unicode Consortium and have an opinion on this. So you have to have like a social media you know, uh, Kickstarter or something to, to try to do that. I think it would be it'd be useful to make the process of getting a new emoji approved more transparent and more uh, accountable and democratic to the people that are using emoji. Um, but I don't know, I don't quite know how you fix that because uh, you know, this is like the Unicode Consortium was set up to, to encode alphabets. They didn't, they didn't think they were going to become the like emotional arbiters for most of the world's population. <laughs> that, that's not what they signed up for. They thought they were encoding like, oh yeah, we found a new hieroglyph. I guess we better add it. Um, <laughs> like, they're just, you know, like they're, they're just like alphabet nerds. Um, so <laughs> I think that we've ended up with this kind of ad hoc system uh, and it would be, you know, like emoji look like we're going to be using them for a while. It would be useful if there was a way to make it more accountable for, um, for which emoji are there. And I think, you know, in general, it's, Air on the side of inclusion, like let's let's include stuff and let people decide if they want to use them. But then at the same time, you run into the problem of information overload, where then it crowds up the emoji you already have, and you can't find the ones that you wanted to use because now they've gotten it's gotten bigger. It's a big it's a big problem. I don't have a solution for it. I just had um, you you spoke at the beginning about how emoji is used in uh, informal textual conversations. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you see a trend toward acceptance of emoji in more formal settings. Um, I'm thinking, for instance, of email, which sort of straddles the universe between informal and formal. Some people are really informal about it. Other people treat it like a letter, and they still sign off. And um, is, is emoji use cropping into those mediums? And what do you think about that? Yeah, I think. I think it's exactly those those mediums that straddle the line between formal and informal. You know, for an email, for example, if you have a bunch of body paragraphs that say, "Yeah, you know," and I've I've, I've executed the deliverables, and we're really working on synergy, um, and then, and then it, this is what business people talk like, right? Um, and then uh, at the end, you say, "Hope you're having a great day, smiley face." You know, this adds a note of humanity to that very corporate email. So I think. You know, in the same way that like, we, we've be, we are long used to navigating these different registers for language when it comes to speech. You know, you can, I can be giving a speech now and then you can talk to me afterwards and I'm not going to talk like this <laughs> because that would make me seem really weird as a person having a normal conversation. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to keep the mic on uh, and I am going to talk differently. Um, so I think, I think, trying to figure out how to navigate that. You know, if you're at a professional conference and you're, you're in your professional mode and you're not swearing and you're, you're being really polite, um, however professionals act. Um, <laughs> well, there's a bunch of students here, right? Um, <laughs> these are some tips. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, you know, but then you have your coffee break and you have your person that you've known for a bit longer and you can have this kind of informal conversation with them. So I think, it's a precisely a, a note of kind of reading your audience and figuring out 
Who's the person that I'm talking with? What's the kind of relationship that I have with them? How do I figure out uh, whether we're on emoji terms or not? Whether this is going to be too informal, too too formal? And email's been navigating this for a long time. You know, there's the do you address the random person you're emailing with their first name out of the blue, or do you go for a salutation? It's like an honorific, and if so, which one do you pick? Um, you know, and heaven forbid, you address somebody who's actually a doctor by Mr. or Ms. Because that's like, you know, so there's a there's a lot of issues that are fraught about formality and informality, and I think emoji have just you know kind of become added to that mix. I don't think we're going to see them being added to you know very very formal genres like academic papers. Um, I think they're going to be pretty rare in that. You can think of the exclamation mark, which is kind of like a it's a very emotional punctuation mark. It's kind of a you know, if you're not on exclamation mark terms, you're really not on emoji terms yet. That's how I think of it as a level of formality. Um, so the exclamation mark gets used a lot in emails to indicate kind of a polite uh, sincerity and uh, it's kind of like the, the uh, McDonald's smile. Um, the, so, but even in, but in academic papers, you don't see exclamation marks. You don't see, you know, and then, you know, we did some statistics. <laughs> And then we combined the chemicals and we found they had a reaction and it was significant exclamation <laughs> mark. <laughs> Our results were just so cool. Um, so you don't see this, you don't see exclamation marks in very formal genres. Um, you know, maybe you see them in like once for, for irony in the title because it's a pop culture reference, but that's it. You know, so I think uh, or you know, if you're reading a very formal, serious book about you know, military history or something like this, you don't see exclamation marks. Um, and exclamation marks have been around for a while, and they have not percolated into these very formal genres, because that's not what very formal genres are doing. They're formal because they're not emotional, uh, and they're kind of detached. So I think what we're seeing is kind of an expansion of the, the possibilities for writing um, into this more emotional domain. And I, some of it may, may bleed over into, um, into some areas, but I think, I think there's going to be a place for dry, formal, sober writing uh, for, for a long time, and it's probably not going to be with emoji. <laughs> right. 